fantastic short film about this woman who was 103 at the time, and she survived the Nazi concentration camps because of her ability as a pianist. And she still played from nine to one every day. Um, and I just wrote a very short poem about her. Pianist 103 looks at the morning where she will play from nine to one and say, how beautiful each note, each sun. Such scales of suffering. No one can weigh them. She says, how beautiful each smile, each footfall, each startled face in the heat of love. I've got one translation in this book. I'm, I'm very interested in translation. And often it seems to me that what we call translation isn't really so because people are not going back to the original text because they don't speak the language. They're going to a prose version and then they're creating their translation after the prose version, which is perfectly legitimate, but it's not, not to my view a translation. I've always loved the poetry of Baudelaire. It was, he was one of the, the poets that very much influenced my teenage writing self, along with, um, later on, Ozzy Mandelstam and Anna Khmatova. And I, I love Baudelaire, I love the rhythm of him. So this poem is a very, very free version, very free translation of his, uh, of his, his, his poem. And I'm, I'll just read a stanza of his so you can get the sound of it and then read my version, which probably sounds very different. Que diras-tu ce soir, pauvre âme solitaire? Que diras-tu, mon cœur, cœur autrefois flétri? À la très belle, à la très bonne, à la très chère, dont le regard divin t'a soudain refleuri. What will you say? What will you say, my soul, poor and alone, and my heart with its heart sucked out? What will you say tonight to the one, if she's really the one this time? To the very beautiful, to the very good, to the very dear? Ah, no. Speak clearly. What will you say to her, so good, so fair, so dear, whose heavenly gaze has made your desert flower? You'll say you've had enough, no more. You've no pride left but what goes to praise her, no strength left but in her douce power, no senses but what she gives. Sweet authority, douce power. Or do you mean you're shit scared to go anywhere without her? Is she your mother? Her look clothes us in light. Her ghost is the scent of a rose. Let her ghost dance with the air. Let its torch blaze through the streets. You'd like that, no doubt, when you've given up running after her. Her ghost will issue commands to do what you've already done. It's over with you. If she won't feed you, you must stay hungry. She is your guardian angel, your bodyguard. No one comes close. You can't love anyone. He's a, he's a fantastic poet and you cannot do justice to him because the sound texture is so rich and that's the problem with translation, I think, getting something across. But there's something about his, his boldness with language that I wanted to capture there. And his, and the impassioned, almost reckless tone of voice that he has, which I find hugely, hugely appealing. Now, Angela has pointed out to me that there's a very large clock which tells the exact time, and that's the one that I've got to watch, so I'm, I'm just squinting towards it now. This is going back to the boat and to the invocations, which are, I suppose, the core of this book. And in the house in which I live, it's a rather unusual house that is actually bolted into a cliff with enormous steel bolts that run right into the rock. And we hope that as they are tightened to the right tension, every so often people go and have a look and make sure they are holding tight. Um, but so it has a, a feeling of almost like being a bird in a nest and you look out over the water. Mm. 
and it has a, there's, there's a lot of balconies and a lot of terraces all the way down. So this is the kitchen balcony. And if you, if you know the place, you probably know exactly where it is, actually. Come out now. Come out now and stand beside me. Grasp the rail as the swell lifts you above the inky, innocent city, which has put away all but the whoop of an ambulance quickly suppressed, all but the chain of lights, all but the chain of lights slung westward across the Mendips, all but the last cry of a drunk by the docks, the salt taste of a locked out tide, the clipping hooves of a police horse. Come out now and stand beside me. I promise I won't look and won't breathe in too deeply the first smoke from the cigarette you have naturally lit. Here are only things you love. Look to your left, where the Matthew rears its cargo of flags, or where masts chink in the dark and a rat pours down a rope from bollard to boat. Come out now and stand beside me. Look at the swans asleep. Tell me gossip about Keats. Drink your drink and smoke your cigarette. Let me ask you all those questions. Or perhaps ask nothing. The gulls say dawn is coming. But I believe that they are wrong and the dark goes on forever. So come out now and stand here in shirt sleeves, although it's midwinter, quietly regarding water and stars. And this poem is for my daughter, who has a very lovely voice and has sung, sung in the choir for many years. And I really like hearing people sing when you can't quite see them or when they think they're alone and they're just singing and the song just pours out of them. I heard you sing in the dark for Tess. I heard you sing in the dark, a few clear notes on the stairs, a blackbird in the cold of dusk, forever folding your wings and slipping rustling down past leaves and ivy knots to where your song bubbled out of the crevices into cold, clear February dusk. <coughs> I heard the notes plain, rising to the surface of evening and then down again, almost chuckling in a blackbird's cold, liquid delight. And so I turned on the landing and you were gone. And I'm going to finish with um, the title poem of the book, which is The Malarkey. And I was very pleased to win the National Poetry Competition with this because it was entered anonymously. And a lot of people enter the competition. And also because, like Sophie, I have worked for a number of years in fiction and published a number of novels. And one question that people then ask you, which I don't enjoy hearing, is are you still writing poetry? Or even have you given up poetry? As if you could just decide, well, you know, I've had enough of poetry, I think I'll give it up, you know, like smoking. Um, and, but yet you almost begin to believe it. Or are people subtly saying to you, oh, you know, the poetry, uh, we're quite glad you're writing novels instead, you know. So, it's a very strange thing, that confidence. Um, and poetry is my, 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 my core, I suppose. It's the thing I do, um, and I hope will always do, and, and will be doing when I'm this very decrepit, invisible, almost dead person. Anyway, this is the malarkey. The malarkey. Why did you tell them to be quiet and sit up straight until you came back? The malarkey would have led you to them. You go from one parked car to another and peer through the misted windows 
before checking the registration. <coughs> Your pocket bulges. You've bought them sweets, but the mist is on the inside of the windows. How many children are breathing? The malarkey is over in the back of the car. The day is over outside the windows. No street light has come on. You fed them cockles soused in vinegar. You took them on the machines. You looked away just once. You looked away just once as you leaned on the chip shop counter and 40 years were gone. You have been telling them forever. Stop that malarkey in the back there. Now they have gone and done it. Is that mist or water with breath in it? Thank you.